Okay, now we're gonna remove the secondary air uh, injection covers. Just eight mil socket. Uh, make sure you remember the orientation of these brackets. Just make assembly go a lot easier. And that one will need a wrench. I'm kind of noticing bolt length is a little different between this one over here and this one. So I'm gonna keep these bolts separated and then I'll I'll bag them up so that they don't get mixed around. Okay, bracket comes off with that one. So the bolts on the right side are a little longer and uh, we're going to clean that up a little bit before we take them out I'm trying to keep as much dirt out of there as I can okay kind of wiped down a little bit better around here be careful these will just lift up off set them aside And then just take note of which way these little valves are oriented. And you're supposed to lift these up out of here, I believe. These are reed valves. I don't really know why we're taking them out. All right, so took the cowling off it's pretty simple there's like a screw on the metal piece uh, and then once you get that off you can reach this screw which takes off the bigger piece and then there's just a couple of little uh, like poke through clips you just pry those out with a screwdriver and then the inner cowling comes off uh, unfortunately in order to do that as you'll notice I had to take off the upper engine crash bar which not a big deal, just uh, an unforeseen little hassle that had to work through. So now we've got a little bit better access to this uh, cover. I'm going to start taking the bolts out and then working our way, trying to get the, uh, the cover lifted off and then also get the coils out of there. I'll also have to, to move this uh, clutch cable, which isn't too bad. You just kind of... Let the cable free and then dismount it from right here, that little bolt. All right, so we've got our cover off. We've pulled out the spark plugs. Uh, actually kind of left them sitting in there. They are all the way unthreaded though. I'm just leaving them in there just in case anything happens to fall down that hole. The spark plug will kind of block it, give me time to retrieve it. Uh, now we've also put the motorcycle in high gear so that we can rotate the wheel and by doing such we rotate the cams and then we're going to start our measurements. Um, if they need to be adjusted then we'll go through the process of removing the crank cover and pulling the cams out and re-shimming. Um, I'm 
guessing we'll probably have to do that <laughs> but with any luck fingers crossed uh the valve timing is actually good and we can just put this all back together and it was a big for nothing um but we'll see from what i understand uh, there's always a couple that have to be changed uh, sometimes if it's really bad you got to change all of them so we'll start measuring these and see where where we end up if we have to go further or can we turn around right here okay so now we're measuring the valve the intake valve on the number one piston and i've already measured uh inlet number one now we're going to do inlet number two and we're going to start with the smallest feeler gauge uh, 0 0.102 millimeters or four thousandths and it goes in so it's got at least the minimum and we're going to check for the maximum 0 0.203 millimeters or eight thousandths It's a little tight. Doesn't go in. But we have the minimum amount of clearance. So looks like both of those are going to be good. If you do want to know the exact measurement, we can. Hi, hey, how you doing? Can you give this to Lauren, please? She's right inside if you want to run it up. Got a, little, got a little visitor here. Okay, so we're going to go up to the next. We'll try point one two seven. And that has a slight drag. So looks like point one two seven is going to be our measurement for that inlet number two valve. And just because I'm geeking out a little bit, I'm gonna see if I can squeeze the, the next size up. Maybe six thousandths. Oh, there it is. So these feeler gauges I have uh, are not specifically uh, metric. They're, they're technically uh, thousandths. Um, mine are by Blue Point, which is sort of an off-brand of Snap-on. Bye, Paul. Bye. Have a good day. You too. You too. And it looks like that would stop. Okay, so looks like we're at about five thousandths on that one, or 0.127 millimeters. So the next thing we're going to do. Uh, is record record that so we don't forget and then we're going to see if any of the other valves can be measured at this point um, obviously getting around to the back side I won't be able to show you near as well uh, as I can here so I'll kind of move along and then once I have another good spot, we'll, we'll do another measurement together. Uh, but it's going to be the same for both sides. You're going to have to rotate the engine so that the lobes of your cam are pointed straight up. And that way when you're measuring the cam to the bucket, uh, you're in that, that biggest gap point. So, all right. We'll just keep working our way around and like I say when I come back to uh, number two and three inlet where it's easy to show you uh, we'll try to show those too. All right so kind of working our way around we now have access to the inlet number three. Of course that's depending on which way you're looking at the engine I guess but in this case we're looking from the rider's perspective cylinder on the far right. Start with our men. Definitely goes in. Uh, 
and we'll go up to our max. Doesn't go, doesn't go, so it falls somewhere in between our minimum and maximum, which is good. We're just going to measure it to just know what it is. looking like the right side uh, which would be inlet number six is about 0.127 millimeters and the left side is 0 0.102 if you don't know how to use feeler gauges uh, you don't force them in between two objects okay uh, if they slide in real easy, use the next next one up. And what you're looking for is some drag. Just a little bit of drag that says, I'm going in, but you don't have to force me. But it's nice and, and snug. If it feels like you're having to push, push real hard, then you need to go a size down and check it. Okay? And sometimes it will kind of fall between the two. But... Um, when you do measure it, if you're having to force it, your, your feeler gauge is too big. Go down a size. And even if it feels a little looser on that end, that's more likely uh, what your gap is going to be. So, you say, well, test. Yeah, that feels perfect. All right, we're going to go ahead and record these. And I'll show you how I've got that set up if you look here I just made kind of a, a page I put my uh, what my measurements are supposed to be and where they're at and so now I'll record these and keep moving along all right we get all the, the measurements done, and uh, as you can see, the exhaust valves are a little tight by about 46 thousandths of a millimeter. So, gonna have to reshim about 75 thousandths smaller than whatever shim is in there right now uh, in order to, to figure that out to get part numbers. We will have to um, pull everything out and uh, measure it with a caliper or a micrometer. And then we'll go to the dealership and order the parts. It's not out by much. I actually contacted a technician at the dealer uh, because obviously they have way more experience on these motorcycles than I do. And his thought was, you know, if it was in his shop, they would do it because they're the dealer and you know that's that's kind of their thing but he thought if you know the home mechanics doing it it's probably uh just that borderline where it'd probably be okay for another six thousand miles but that at that point i would definitely be doing this again and so my thought at first was okay it's not that big of a deal um maybe we'll just roll with it as is, get another 6,000 miles out of it, and then do this again. But I was kind of thinking, we've already come this far that why not just do it? I've already taken everything down and it gives me the opportunity to show you the rest of this job. So there's that, plus the fact that I'd rather not do this in 6,000 miles. I'd rather at least wait another 12 before I do this again. So that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna we're gonna pull the shims out, and um, and we'll show you the rest of this. So the first thing I've done to prepare for pulling the 
the crankcase cover or the crank cover is drain the oil that way it doesn't spill out all over the place your service kit does come with a new oil filter uh, you'll just need to to get some new oil to replace it and then it also comes with all the gaskets uh, I think I was showing you that uh, it comes in the kit and the part numbers um, I'll put down in the, the link below but this 12,000 mile service kit comes with the spark plugs the gaskets the uh, the seals and all the stuff that you'll need uh, also the the cam chain tensioner uh, it comes with new uh, seals for that gasket I think it's a gasket and an o-ring uh, so we'll have to pull that out also I was looking over the the cam removal and there's kind of one thing I don't understand is they want you to loosen the sprockets from the camshaft I don't understand why they want you to loosen it if you're not going to take it off prior to removing it from the engine uh, my thought is I don't want to do that step I'm going to attempt to remove the the cam uh, ladder plate I think they call it and remove the cams without loosening the sprockets that way it should go back together uh, with the same timing and then I won't have to worry about that there is one tool that I'm not sure if I'm gonna need it or not um, once you get down into the cam or not the cam the crank behind the crank cover um, there's some alignment um, things you have to look for one of them is a dot through sort of a, a viewpoint and the other one is an alignment tool and I'm not sure if I can just you know use a separate tool for that but we'll see as we go along and I'll try to make this as painless as possible all right once you've removed all the, the bolts from the crank cover you'll also notice that two of them this one and this one are longer manual says to discard them but uh, the service kit doesn't come with any new, any new ones and I don't want to replace them just because it says so you'll notice there's a little lip here on the case or on the cover you can use to to kind of get this started and remove it from the engine see timing chain in there <clears throat> move on to the next step all right so got the engine line there is a dot there on one of the gears and then I've used just a, an old bolt for an alignment tool I'm sure that will be fine. If I feel too much force, I'll back off. Uh, using an old wood handled paintbrush to use as a wedge to hold tension on the timing chain when I get ready to take the tensioner out. Also, notice that the two lines on the cranks, or I'm sorry, the uh, cams point inward and that's where you want them when you start to disassemble this Got our cam chain tensioner off, and we're ready to start loosening this uh, this camshaft ladder, as they call it. You'll notice that it has to be loosened in sequence again. Your uh, 
your cam sprockets are on this side. So once again, this is as if you're looking from the front of the bike towards the rear. But I feel like it's easier to think of it from left to right. So as you'll see, it makes it kind of upside down because from the rider position and really the position of, you know, where you're going to be working on it from, your cam sprockets are on the opposite side. So we're going to end up doing these in sequence. It's going to go, uh, looks like, it's going to go from outside to in, on both sides, and it'll work your way across. So you'll have to look here and just get a good understanding of which bolt you're going to loosen first and uh, and just do that in sequence. that right out of there and we'll leave all the bolts in place so looks like the dowels all stayed in these o-rings one of them stuck to here the other two are down here uh, there's also larger o-rings around the holes where the spark plugs go and uh, those are all going to get replaced they'll come in your service kit so we'll set this aside and work on the next piece, getting that cam out so we can get down to the shims. One thing I decided to do before I started taking the cams out was to uh, kind of wipe off some of the oil and mark these with a Sharpie. That way I kind of know what tooth went to which piece of chain link. So I know that you've still got the, the lines marked up here but even one tooth off can cause a lot of problems. So I went ahead and marked these. Just hopefully make reassembly a lot faster and simpler and less room for error. All right, I'm gonna take our wedge out and I'm gonna try to keep the intake cam where it is. Lift the chain up and over. And then I'm going to lift this cam up and out. And we'll hang the chain up here on the other cam since we're not going to pull it out. Don't have to go fishing after it later. So, all of my exhaust valves had the same exact amount of uh, valve clearance. So they should they should all have the same shim, you would think, but that's not necessarily true. So what we'll do is we'll lift these out of here one by one taking note of which valve it came out of, and then we'll be measuring the shims. So we can make sure to buy the, the correct shim replacement. And got a magnet here. I'm gonna wrap my magnet in a cloth just to keep it. Cause I know my magnet's not clean. So lift this up out of here, and then down inside you'll see the shim. That's the piece that we're going to need to change. So we'll take that out and we're going to measure it with a micrometer. Although it does have the size written on it, if it hasn't worn off. This one says 252. So I'm not sure if that's a part number or that's an actual shim size. Uh, we'll find out when we start measuring it. 
but I'm gonna go ahead and record this on a sheet of paper and I'm gonna move back down the line. I'm gonna leave these in place until I actually have new ones. So I'm gonna record this, I'll measure it, and then I'm gonna put it back in. Uh, that way, if something goes awry at the dealership and they don't have shims, these will all go back in the same place I took them out. So my valve clearance will at least be no worse than it was when I started. I'm going to use a uh, micrometer to measure these. Now you can use a dial caliper. Obviously micrometer is a little bit more accurate. And this one's coming out to right at 0.1 inches. So We'll write that down and then see what part number correlates with that to make sure that uh, everything's where it should be and then we'll move on to the next one. All right, here I get to do one of these uh, cool tabletop things. Uh, for this, you're gonna need a pen, and the calculator and something to write on. All right, so you got your cams out, you measured your valve clearance, you've measured your shims, you've recorded all those numbers. Now it's time to make sense of that uh, and figure out what our new shims are gonna be. So the equation's pretty simple. You're gonna take The measured valve clearance, you're going to subtract the OEM spec, and then you're going to add back the old shim size, and that's going to give you your new shim. Okay, so in my case, uh, just pick one valve to show you. It measured the valve clearance, measured 0.279 millimeters. Uh, the mid-range for mine is 0 0.350 millimeters. I say mid-range because they say it's okay, it's within spec if it's anywhere between 0.325 and 0.375. So the, for the purposes of reshimming, we'll just aim for the midpoint. And if we fall a little bit on either side of that, you'd still be within spec. Plus the old shim, which was measured to be 0.2, or I'm sorry, 2.50 millimeters. And so if we run this through our calculator, 0.279 minus 0.350 equals negative. 0 0.071 and then add back the old shim it's going to give us 2.429 millimeters so that's great that gives us uh, a number to shoot for when we're trying to go by shims unfortunately that is not a shim size that they make. So you have to get close to it. So we'll have our number of what our target is and then see how close we can get to it. So hot cams comes in 0 0.050 millimeter increments. Pro X and OEM shims come in increments of 0 0.025 millimeters. So they come in uh, smaller increments. So if I ended up going with the hot cams because OEM was not available at my dealership. Um, but after this, you'll see why I would have gone with uh, one of these two uh, instead of hot cams.
they're fine they're within range um, but you can get a little closer obviously with the smaller increments so we'll take our 2.429 and we'll round it 2.43 which if we're looking at 0 0.05 increments uh, that's gonna from my elementary days gonna lead us to a point 2.45 millimeter shim but had we gone with this one we don't really need to round anything we can use that number and we can see that uh, 2.5 is closer than 5.0 and we could have gone with a 2.425 millimeter shim and that would have put us a little bit closer to perfect. So uh, next time when we order shims, we'll go with uh, probably OEM spec. Um, unfortunately, you don't really know what sizes you need until you got the motorcycle apart. And if your dealership is not uh, very good about keeping parts like that in stock, you may have to shop online and go with uh, maybe a Pro X, but choice is yours. Depends on how long you want the bike apart. All right, I hope you enjoyed the math. Um, as you can see, it is not difficult. Um, and you can go online and do like valve shim calculators and enter this stuff too. But uh, that's it. Um, and this was for the Tiger 900, one of the uh, exhaust shims. So if you have any questions about this equation, uh, it's easy to find online, or you can just hit me up in the comments. All right, uh, that'll take us into part four, when we'll start dropping in new shims and putting everything back together. Uh, please watch that. Uh, probably have a few things to, to think about uh, before you start this job.